worked for me. Good afternoon. Mary, it'll just be a few more minutes. I'm trying to move people over from the attendees list into the panelist list. Now, Mary, can you hear me? This is Diana. Yes, okay. I can. Thank you. Are we, are we ready or are we still waiting for people? Still waiting, just a moment. We have some audio issues that Aubrey's trying to take care of. Okay, testing. You try to do what you just did. Okay. I can hear it from somewhere. Maybe it's my R. No, mine mine is on the headset. Yeah, it's not you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why it doesn't work. Okay, I think we're ready to go.
Okay. Welcome to the Salt Lake City Planning Division Appeals Hearing. We're here today to hear case number PLN APP 2023-00303, which is an appeal of a conditional use denial at approximately 2011 South 1300 East for a come and go gas station and convenience store. Um, my intention is, is to proceed as follows. First of all, I've read all of the materials, the staff report, um, all of the public comment, which was quite entertaining in some places, particularly the person who thought there should be a Weezer Memorial at the site. Um, I think, um, and I've also listened to the Planning Commission, the YouTube video of the Planning Commission meeting. So I'm aware, I've read the briefs, I've read everything. I think I'm aware of the issues. My intention in these hearings is generally not to set a time limit for people because I wanna make sure that everyone has a chance to say what they need to say and put what needs to be on the record on the record, but just be aware that I have read everything and I'm aware of the facts and the history. Um, my intention is to have the appellant go forward first, followed by Salt Lake City. This is not a public hearing, so there won't be a public comment period. After a response from Salt Lake City, I'll allow the appellant to come back and address anything that Salt Lake City has raised. Um, first of all, before we go forward, why doesn't everyone um, who's going to speak at this go ahead and make an appearance, a record of who you are and who you're representing? And my name is Mary Woodhead, and I'm the land use hearing officer today. Thank you, ma'am. My name is Chris Hogel. Um, I'm counsel with the firm of Holland and Hart. I'm here on behalf of the applicant. Um, I've got with me on the call some representatives from the applicant in case something comes up where they need to explain maybe some of the more technical aspects of the record. Um, but also appearing is uh, Havila Cody, who's uh, also a lawyer with my law firm. Okay, thank you. Hey, good evening, Ryan Halder, uh, Come and Go Convenience Stores. I'm Christian Michelson with Galloway and Company. We're the uh, civil engineer for Come and Go. Okay, thank you. Nate Abbott with Galloway and Company, also uh, representing Come and Go. Uh, Brian Horan, also with Galloway and Company. And who's here for Salt Lake City? Diana Martinez, I'm the planning uh, planner on this application. Okay, and Kathleen, I think maybe you're still muted. Are you here for Salt Lake City? Catherine, we can't hear you. You might need to allow audio. Um, if you go to the microphone in the lower left side of your screen and select the up arrow, um, there should be an, an option to allow audio. So is that audio still not working for Catherine? It doesn't look like it. Um, Catherine, if you leave the meeting and come back in, it's the first box that'll come back up when you're moved into the meeting. While we're waiting, I'll introduce myself. I'm Nick Norris. I'm the planning director for Salt Lake City and I'm here as needed. So hopefully we'll be quiet <laughs> for the whole meeting. <laughs> And I'm Ayara Lima, Zoning Administrator for the Planning Division, Salt Lake City. Okay, thank you, everyone. I'm Mike Domino with uh, Seneca Companies, and I'm representing Come and Go as well. Okay. Thank you. I Hold think we're now. just, oh, yes, we can hear you now. 
Excellent. Sorry about that. And you're uh, here on and you're here on behalf of Salt Lake City. I am Catherine Pasker, senior city oh. attorney here on behalf of Salt Lake City. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're go going to go ahead and get started and I'll turn the time over to Mr. Hogel. I just want to remind everyone that this is basically an appeal on the record, the record as it was before the planning commission, except to the extent that there are issues about that record um, and what was allowed in or not allowed in. But otherwise, the appeal is is tied to the record that was before the Planning Commission. So go ahead, Mr. Hogel. Thank you. Um, so on behalf of the applicant, we're here because of because the Planning Commission's denial of the conditional use permit was illegal, arbitrary, and capricious. Um, but I'd like to start with the record, which is where you uh, just let, what you just last referenced. Um, Salt Lake City, in the city's response to the appeal. Uh, alleges that we have attached matters outside the record, which we have not. Um, they say that a table on page tw uh, 20 of our appeal brief is outside the record. It is not, as it is footnoted with a footnote. Um, let me, can I go ahead and share my screen? Um, I think the planning administration has to do that, but I, that's fine. Okay. Um, you should be able to start. You see that. that on my this page out of our, our appeal brief. Yes. Okay. So this is the this is page twenty, and this is the table, and um, you can see it's it's footnoted from the traffic impact study. So it's not new. It's just a a restatement of certain facts from the traffic impact study. Um, also objected to is a portion of Exhibit 1, a timeline, and the timeline just is a restatement of things that are in the record. Nothing new, it's already in the record. The rest of Exhibit 1 consists of emails between the applicant and staff, which should also be part of the record already. Um, also objected to is Exhibit 3, to my appeal brief. And exhibit three is nothing more than, well, it's this is this aerial map, but it's it's an enlarged version of what's already in the record and part of our exhibit one um, at in exhibit one, this email right here. So this is an email exchange with Diana Martinez between uh, her and Nate Abbott. It's it's already part of the record. And then finally, Exhibit 4 was objected to. That's also an email right here, Exhibit 4. That's an email um, with staff, Nate Abbott from the applicant. And that includes Jason Draper, who's with the, the Public Util Utilities Department. So this is this should be part of the record. Um, unlike the applicant, it's the city that contends or that feels the need to augment the record. Um, in fact, the city's response is replete with alleged facts not in the record. Um, for example, on pages 18 through 20, 27 and 30, there are allegations about other come and go stores from websites that are not in the record. Links to the websites are in an email from a member of the public, but the websites themselves are not in the record. Um, on page 15 of the city's response, there's reference or discussion about a 2012 traffic study. That study is not part of the record. On pages 22 to 23 and 28 of the city's response, there's matters that come from a, a New England Interstate Waste Pollution Control Commission website, neiwpcc.org. Um, there's a, a link to that website in one of the emails from a member of the public, but the data itself uh, from the website is not in the record. And then finally, um, there's information apparently from this www.sciencedaily.com website uh, referenced on page 28 and note one, footnote 103 in the city's response. Um, that's not in the record. Uh, there's a link 
to the website. So the website is identified, but the information from the website, the website itself is not in the record. Um, so it's, it's really the city that it's ironic that they uh, uh, accuse the applicant of adding things to the record. We don't, but it's really the city who feels the need to do that to support the planning commission denial. So um, your, posi your position is that links in the record to data, that that data, which was referenced to members of the planning commission to look at, is not part of the record? Absolutely not. Yeah, it's okay. not part of the record. I mean, you know, I could cite to the whole internet. Does that mean the whole okay. internet is fair game? Absolutely. And we weren't, you know, and, and these emails are, are part of 500 pages of public comment. Uh, most of which we received for the first time, um, you know, a couple of weeks before the planning commission hearing, right? So uh, there's no indication in the in the record that the planning commission visited those websites, referred to any of that data. If it was important enough, um, then it should have been made part of the record, the data itself. And that way, the applicant could have a full and fair opportunity to respond to it. Let me uh, address the illegality of the Planning Commission's denial of the conditional use permit application. Um, I'll start with Utah law. So I've got on the screen, Utah code section 109A306. Uh, subsection two says, if a land use regulation does not plainly restrict a land use application, the land use authority shall interpret and apply the land use regulation to favor the land use application. Uh, gas stations are not plainly restricted in Salt Lake City land use regulations. They're conditionally allowed. Um, so because of that, the Planning Commission should have, shall interpret and apply the land use regulations to favor the land use application. Clearly, the Planning Commission did not do so. Um, another problem uh, another illegality is that the Planning Commission imposed a higher standard than allowed. I've got on the screen now Utah Code Section 109A507. And under subsection 2A Romanet 2 or 2II, um, it makes clear that reasonable mitigation of anticipated detrimental uh, effects does not mean elimination of detrimental effects. They can't impose uh, a standard that requires elimination of anticipated impacts. That's what they did. Um, also, the Planning Commission's denial, which is based on the staff report, uh, invokes the Groundwater Source Protection Overlay District Ordinance, section 21A.34.060, the staff arrogated to itself enforcement and administration without authority and without expertise and experience. There's no public utilities department report or referral in the record. Um, for most of what I plan to do today is respond to the arguments and assertions in the city's response. Um, and the first of which is on this illegality point um, pertaining to section 306 of M. Ludma. So the city says that gas stations are a conditional use and they're restricted under that groundwater source protection overlay ordinance that I just cited to. Um, but there's nothing in the city's regulations that plainly restrict, uh, in the conditional use regulations that plainly restrict gas stations. In fact, they're, they're allowed, they're conditionally allowed. Um, there's no plain restriction um, with respect to the um, groundwater, the groundwater source protection. Um, the city says that this advises against issuing a conditional use permit for this use at the property. It does no such thing. Uh, here it is on the screen. And this is um, um, subsection E and subsection F that I have on the screen. First, let me talk about how this is really for the uh, public Utilities Department to apply and administer. And you can see that under F. Um, so in this section that relates to review of development plans and permits, it, it says 
that the in this subsection one, it has a procedure um, with respect to development plans and permit applications. And you can see from the section there that nowhere does it mention the planning division having any part to play in the process. Instead, it says that the review process for new restricted uses, quote, shall include referral of proposed plans and specifications to the public utilities department for review. I noticed that it says that those um, permit applications shall be submitted to public utilities. Did you submit your proposal to the utilities department? We did not, nope. But we didn't invoke the groundwater source protection overlay ordinance either. The city did that in the staff report and the planning commission adopted it. So really what the city says now in their response brief is that this, this process would be premature um, because a, a uh, uh, occupancy permit or whatever permit they think would invoke this wasn't, wasn't offered, wasn't filed. Well, if it's premature to begin this process, then it was premature for the city to invoke this ordinance in the first place. Um, they invoked it, but only to, to mention the fact that the property is within this secondary recharge area uh, and is therefore restricted, quote, restricted under this ordinance. That's as far as they got. But what this ordinance says is that that's just the beginning of the process. Under F2, uh, it, if the public utilities department finds that the proposed use will not have an adverse impact on groundwater quality or that the potential adverse impacts can be mitigated by implementing best management practices or other strategies, the permit may be approved. So they, the city got as far as invoking this, but they didn't want to send it to the public utilities department. They didn't want to follow the review of development plans, uh, subdivisions of this ordinance uh, for whatever reason, I don't know. Maybe they feared that the public utilities department would find that the proposed use is compatible because there's no groundwater there. And even if there were groundwater there, the proposal has substantial protections that would mitigate any impacts. Now it does say that the permits and plans can be denied, but you see who, who is assigned the role of that denial. It's the public utilities department that plays the role in, de in determining whether a restricted use should be denied or not not the planning division. Um, all right. Now, the other thing I wanted to bring out about this is that it doesn't prohibit gas stations and secondary recharge areas. It only means that further study is needed. So in F2, right, that's where it has the process, the review criteria. If the public utilities department finds that the use won't have an adverse impact on groundwater quality or that the potential adverse impact impacts can be mitigated, then the permit can go forward. That's what, that's what the city didn't want to have happen for this. Um, so this isn't a plain restriction within the terms of section 306 of LUDMA. In fact, it says uh, the planning, the the um, public utilities de department needs to just review this to make a final determination. Um, also, to point out is that uh, on whether that on whether this is a, a prohibited use in a secondary recharge area, there's lots of underground storage tanks in the secondary resource area, uh, secondary recharge area. Um, so this is a, um, an exhibit from our brief that was presented to the Planning Commission. It's printed from the Utah DEQ interactive map. We have overlaid and estimated in blue here, uh, we've estimated where the secondary recharge zone is. And each and every one of these blue dots is an underground storage tank, each and every one. So the ordinance, this groundwater source ordinance is anything it's nowhere close to a prohibition or a plane restriction on gas station. In Do you know the timing of the ordinance versus when those storage tanks were installed? 
I don't know. I do know that the ordinance was enacted 25 years ago. So I, I don't have a date for each and every one of these blue dots. I think it's fair to say some of them are within within the last 25 years, at least. Um, all right. So the groundwater source protection uh, is is inapplicable. Um, it's really irrelevant to this uh, to this permit application. Um, another another thing to point out, it's a real fundamental problem with the city's response. Um, it, it effectively, the city's response invites you to violate the 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 section five hundred seven of of M -Ludma. Um, These sub provisions go together. Um, so you got to take a look at, let, let me back up and, and explain. So the city asserts that a gas station would impair um, vague subjective notions like community livability for which there's no objective standard set forth in an applicable ordinance. And that's what's required, right? These subdivisions kind of go together. 1A in section 507 says, a municipality may adopt a land use ordinance that includes conditional uses and provisions for conditional uses that require compliance with objective standards set forth in an applicable ordinance, right? Objective standards. Um, and then 2C says, if the reasonably anticipated detrimental effects of a proposed conditional use cannot be substantially mitigated by the proposal or the imposition of reasonable conditions, to achieve compliance with applicable standards, the land use authority may deny the conditional use. So the city wants to read out this part here about to achieve compliance with applicable standards. So what this means is the city can deny a conditional use permit only if the impacts cannot be mitigated by conditions to achieve compliance with applicable standards. And those applicable standards, according to the same statute, subsection one, have to be objective standards and they have to be set forth in an applicable ordinance. So in other words, the city can't deny the conditional use permit based on standards outside an applicable ordinance, like standards contained in American jurisprudence or secondary authority or case law outside of Utah. And the city can't deny a conditional use permit based on subjective standards that aren't objective. But that's what the city argues in its response. The city says that the gas station would impair walkability, the calm natural beauty and habitat of the park. It wouldn't foster community goals in taking advantage of park views. It didn't offer a community gathering place. It was vehicle focused redundant of a gas station nearby, would add noise, traffic, bicycle, and pedestrian conflicts, and this is probably my favorite, other effects. What does that mean? These are subjective standards. They're inscrutable. They're prone to abuse. A, a, a landowner, it's impossible for a landowner to know where the finish line is, right? How walkable does the land use have to be? How calm? There's no objective standard. Some of these standards are set forth not in the Salt Lake City regulations, but elsewhere, or as far as I can tell, nowhere. So for instance, in master plans, language in master plans is generally not relevant in your, your position is that unless they're reduced to specific ordinance, they can't be enforced. I think a master plan, if it has an objective standard, you know, might. It, it, but you know you have to apply the rest of the statute as well, the rest of Section 507. But what is not appropriate for master plans or anywhere or, or from any other source is some uh, subjective, vague notion like you know community livability. That's a quote from the city's response. There's no way to assess whether something is livable enough. And the problem with it is is that the city can constantly say no matter what we do. The city can say, well, I, I, I appreciate what you've done to make it more livable, but it's not livable enough. 
Um, and that is what MLABA says the city cannot do. But that's what the response says you should do. <laughs> um, and a basis to uh, affirm the denial by the planning commission of the conditional use permit application. Um, so here's, here's some other examples. I said, mentioned community livability. Another quote from the city's response, pedestrian friendliness, right? Another one, vehicle dependence. They talk about traffic flow without giving any objective criteria for what the applicant would have to do. Some objective criteria by which we could satisfy what the city wants for traffic flow mitigation. And not only that, but it's got to be in a pre-existing ordinance. They can't just make it up as they go along. They talk about gasoline vapors and vehicle exhaust. Well, how much of that is too much? How much of it's okay? There's no uh, city ordinance that they can present that has the objective criteria. What they did was just sit back and think of all the things that they don't like about gas stations and say, yeah, it's too much of that. That's not appropriate. You can't do that. Um, those are vague subjective standards that can't be the basis of a denial. Um, you mentioned the city plans, master plans. Um, the city says that the gas station must be consistent with uh, the plan Salt Lake, the Sugar House master plan, and the, and we, the groundwater source protection overlay ordinance, which we talked about, we'll bring up again. So from the plan Salt Lake, what the city says from that is, quote, it is critical that alternatives to the automobile be considered in all decisions made by the city. So that's the standard from Plan Salt Lake that we have to meet. That's inscrutable. That's not an objective standard. The conditional use permit can't be denied on, on that basis. It's also hopelessly vague. Um, automobile alternatives, considered in all decisions? How is the landowner, the applicant, supposed to satisfy that? Um, here's section 306 again. If a land use regulation does not plainly restrict a land use application, the land use authority shall interpret and apply the land use regulation to favor the land use application. Where the plan, the plan Salt Lake says, it is critical that alternatives to the automobile be, be considered in all decisions made by the city, that's not, a plain restriction, that's, that's inscrutable. That's completely ambiguous. And ambiguities have to be resolved in the applicant's favor. So in addition to the plan Salt Lake, the city mentions this Sugar House Master Plan. And according to that, according to the city, uh, the property is supposed to be low intensity mixed use, which is described as quote, an integration of residential with small business uses, typically at ground floor levels. Height limits generally include one and two story structures. The intent is to support more walkable community development patterns located near transit lines and stops. The plan further provides the recommendation to quote, eliminate incompatible automobile oriented uses where allowed. So, this isn't a plain restriction on gas stations either. The only, object, the only objective criteria in all of that that the city mentioned is the height limit, right? That's the only thing you can look to to say, okay, yeah, that's an objective standard. Height limits generally include one and two story structures. All right, so you can't have anything higher than a one or two story structure. Okay, but you know, our use complies with that. It's a single story building. The rest of this is, is not an objective standard. It's hopeful. So limiting car oriented uses is not objective. Correct. It's not. So does that mean like zero vehicles? Is that what that means? That's not, I don't think it's what it means because there's lots of uses in this CV zone where people drive to. And it can't mean zero. Um, it just it says more walkable community. More walkable? Again, I go to the city and I say, look, I've got sidewalks on my site. I'm, I will put sidewalks there. Um, doesn't that mean it's walkable? Why is that not walkable enough? There's nothing in Salt Lake City land use regulations 
that says that that's not enough. There's no uh, objective criteria. So this, this sugar house master plan can't, can't, it simply can't be the basis to deny the conditional use permit under section 507. Ultimately, you know, really the only objective standard that the city can impose is the one prohibited by uh, M. Ludma, this 2A Romanet 2 here. The city won't be satisfied unless the applicant eliminates any and all impacts. Uh, this is clear from the footnote at the end of the city's response on page uh, 31, note 112. It says that the only way the city would be satisfied is if the use operated without fuel storage tanks and with equipment and features like high walls that would go well beyond mitigating the impacts and eliminate them, right? I mean, mitigation is simply lessen the severity of. It doesn't mean eliminating. And, and this is what M. Ludma said. The proposed conditional, it can't be required that we eliminate detrimental effects. But that's the only objective criteria that they want to impose. Um, they can't require that. The city denies that they're doing this, but then confirms that that's exactly what they're doing. So on page 30 of the city's response, the city says, not so, in response to our assertion that the Planning Commission required us to eliminate detrimental effects, right? But the response doesn't explain how that's not so. Instead, right after that, the city says, quote, the Planning Commission's conclusion is based on the unique proximate open space and water resources immediately adjacent to the property. So in other words, the Planning Commission should be able to require the applicant to eliminate detrimental effects because the property is so close to a park. That's illegal. That's illegal under Section 507. In addition to the decision being illegal, the decision was arbitrary and capricious. So the Planning Commission denied the application based on imagined impacts that aren't reasonably anticipated and without evidence that at the applicant's measures would substantially mitigate any reasonably anticipated impacts. So there's impacts to media, environmental media that they mentioned, uh, groundwater, surface water, air, and then they also mentioned traffic. Let me talk about groundwater. Um, there's no evidence of any groundwater in the area near the property to be impacted. The only evidence on the existence of groundwater is that the property is within this vast recharge area where there's lots of underground storage tanks already. The fact that there's lots of underground storage tanks though doesn't mean that there isn't groundwater. I mean, that's not a cause and effect um, analysis, really. But neither does the groundwater source protection overlay zone. Neither does the fact that this is a the secondary recharge area. That doesn't mean this whole area is saturated with groundwater. All it means is that the, the public utilities department gets to take a closer look at it, which was an opportunity that was not, that didn't happen in this case. So there's, there's no, there's absolutely no evidence of groundwater. We presented evidence that our borings down to 41 feet found no groundwater. There's no evidence of that. Um, if there were any, we presented evidence that whatever is there would be substantially mitigated. We put in evidence of robust protection. So this is part of our appeal brief and part of our submission to the Planning Commission. This groundwater protection, this goes on and on. Yes, I've read it. You've read it. So I'm not going to read it to you. I'm just going to point it out. Um, there's lots of mitigation measures that will be, that are proposed. And they're not all reactive, as the city said. Most of them are preventative. Like, I'll just point out one example. This first one. This overfill protection valve set to close at 95% tank capacity. So if the fuel gets at or above 95%, the valve shuts off so that it can't be fueled anymore. And it just goes on and on. Double wall fiberglass tanks. That's not reactive. That's preventative. It goes on and on and on. Surface water. 
any pathway, only Parley's Creek was mentioned by Jason Draper, uh, the expert that the planning staff uh, asked. Uh, Parley's Creek is the only one identified and any pathway of surface water to Parley's Creek will be eliminated. In fact, what Mr. Draper said was that um, here on, on this page of the staff report, he just says, or he's attributed to be to have said, additional stormwater management treatment and controls will be required. So he says, you know, stormwater goes to Parley's Creek, but he didn't say that's the end of it. He just said additional stormwater management treatment and controls will be required. The city planning staff ignored that part, um, but the stormwater management treatment and controls is exactly what the applicant is proposing in spades. So we've got all these lines of defense um, that we laid out. This is part of our uh, submission to the planning commission, also part of our appeal. All these lines of defense, um, and there's illustrations of them earlier in the submission. Air quality, there's no harm. There's no evidence of any anything or anyone at risk from levels of vapors reasonably anticipated from the gas station. And also, if there were any, there's mitigation measures here um, on these pages of the brief, vapor controls, vapor controls in the tanks, vapor controls to keep the fueling trucks, the tank trucks from, from having vapor released, um, substantial mitigation, traffic. The, the traffic study, the only traffic study that's in the record is the one that the applicant did. And this is a table, table 6.1 from that traffic impact study. It's clear that the intersection is at a level of service C in the, in the mornings at the peak and is at an E for the afternoon peak. And then afterwards, if this uh, use were allowed, it would be exactly the same level of service, exactly the same. C in the morning, E in the afternoon. And then there's still mitigations though. We're still trying to improve the situation. This use- that, That's the only traffic study in the record, but the public comments, which I admit are full of a lot of irrelevant clamor, are also, there are numerous statements of people who live in the area who talk about the serious traffic problems at that intersection and in that neighborhood. So that's also part of the record with regard to traffic. Isn't that right? It's part of the record, but um, you know, substantial evidence is different than just something being in the record. Substantial evidence is more robust than that. It's gotta be something sufficient to convince the reasonable mind to support a conclusion. And all, all the, the public can talk about is what's there right now. That's all they know about. They can't tell what would what it would be if this use were to go in, and they don't like the way it is now. But there's nothing in Salt Lake City regulations or Utah law that says a conditional use applicant has to improve existing traffic situations to get the permit approved. Why are we going to come in and, and improve things? That's not the law. Um, but you know what? We would improve the safety because we're gonna eliminate, if allowed, we would eliminate an access point. Right now, there's two access points on 13th East and we'd eliminate one of them. The city agrees, the city says, I mean, it's so begrudging. I mean, you can tell the city, the city hated to write this statement, but they said, well, okay, it's quote likely. Removing, the, eliminating this one access point is likely to reduce the number of conflict points for pedestrian and bicycle traffic. It's not likely to reduce them, it absolutely would. Um, we, were, we agreed with the city staff to reduce the number of parking spaces. We agreed with city staff to reduce the number of gasoline fueling pumps. We agreed with the city to limit truck deliveries between 7 a.m. and 10 p.m. Those are mitigations that we agreed to. They're substantial, they're significant. Here's what the so city- Normally you would have fuel deliveries in the middle of the night. So you're, it's a mitigation for you to not do that? Yeah, well, it's, it's reduction of flexibility. 
right? It's going to cost come and go money to limit the times in which it can have fuel trucks delivered. So that's significant. The city says, well, what about impacts to soils? Um, what, where My response is, where's the objective standard set forth in applicable ordinances about impacts to soils? They can't just say, well, there might be some impact to soils. Well, there might be impacts to the asphalt that we put around the fueling pumps too. So what? There's no Salt Lake City regulation that said you can't have an impact to soil. Remember, the permit could only be denied if no reasonable condition could be proposed to achieve compliance with applicable standards. And those applicable standards must be objective standards set forth in an applicable ordinance. They can't just sit back and take pot shots. They got to identify an objective standard set forth in an applicable ordinance. No ordinance was presented with respect to soil impact. The city says, well, the applicant's robust protections, like the double wall containment and leak detection, the city says those belie the contention that there's nothing to impact. That's what they say in their response. Their, my response to that is, there is nothing, that doesn't show that there's any impacts, there's anything to impact. What that shows is that there's state and federal regulations that apply that require certain levels of protection uh, and equipment that apply regardless of whether there's any uh, groundwater or surface water to impact. Another thing is we want to sell gas and we can't sell gas that's leaked onto the ground or released out of the tank. So that's another reason why we want to keep the fuel in the tank. Um, spills will, would be quickly detected and handled, not because we think that there's some sensitive uh, thing that could be impacted, but we want to maintain a clean site and to offer the customers uh, a positive experience. Um, they also say, they try to turn this on us. Well, you agreed to some of the staff recommendations. Why did you do that if you think there's nothing to impact? Well, I mean, realistically, we, we want to get a positive recommendation for the conditional use permit. That's why we did it. Do we think if it was up to us, we wouldn't think it'd be necessary. But they said, can you agree to this? And we tried to go uh, meet them as far as we could along that line. We want to we want to get a positive recommendation. Come and go wants to be a good neighbor and they want to have a good positive relationship with the city. Those are the reasons why we did those things rather than because we're afraid that there's some uh, some vulnerability in the area. Now, let me talk about traffic. The city says that the use would generate 64 net new weekday AM and 60 new, 60 net new weekday PM peak hour vehicle trips, as well as 679 net new weekday daily trips. Well, consistent with best practices, traffic engineering best practices, that is based on the um, the site, excuse me, while I get my bearings here, as the staff report says, which I have here, this is the staff report at page 13. The study was conducted last year when the Sizzler, that's the pre-existing use, was inoperable. And there were no counts taken from the subject property because there were no cars entering or exiting the property. So the, the site was vacant. So yeah, there'd be these 64 new, the, you know, 679 new trips, but that's starting from zero. Well, it's, is it, why can't they start from zero since zero is the status quo? Well, what's the objective, what is the objective standard set forth in an applicable ordinance that says zero? I mean, is the argument really that any use at this site should generate zero new net trips, zero new trips? regardless of the impact on the roadway's graded level of service. There's no standard like that in applicable city ordinances. I'm not asking you this question to be adversarial, but the if the status quo is zero and the traffic study is saying, what's the change that this use is going to bring? Why isn't zero the appropriate place to look at? Well, because there's no, because zero, I would, I would agree with you that zero is an objective standard. That's a, that's a number that you can see and, and know whether you're there or not. But the problem with that is that it's not set forth in an applicable ordinance. Remember, they could deny 
um, the application if the impacts can't be mitigated just you know that's not the end of it the, the, they could deny the application if the impacts couldn't be mitigated quote to achieve compliance with applicable standards right not just to achieve compliance with what they they'd like to see it's to achieve compliance with applicable standards standards that are objective set forth in an applicable ordinance. So, and you know, when you add new trips, when you have a new use, um, like a gas station or, you know, the KFC across the street, yeah, there's gonna be vehicles that drive to it. But the way that in, in planning circles and traffic engineering, the way that you assess that, the, the objective criteria that you apply is this graded, levels of service, right? We've, we've seen, and you've read, I'm sure, um, a lot about, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F levels of service, right? That's the objective criteria. And, you know, it's going to be the same level of service, whether this use goes in or not. Um, the city points to a 0 0.1 difference in the AM peak hour level of service, you know, one-tenth of a point, that is utterly insubstantial and insignificant. It doesn't alter the graded level of service at all, right? It's, you know, C, E before, it's going to be C, E after. There's no other objective standard that the city can identify and present, and therefore, it was wrong, it was arbitrary and capricious and illegal for the city to deny the permit application on that basis. The, the city staff report even, it kind of goes so far to, to say, really, it's not about the capacity. You know, this is page, what is this? This is a page out of the staff report, it's page 13. It says, this is not a capacity issue, it's a livability issue. That's a subjective standard. You can't, under 507, you can't apply that standard to deny the, the permit application. Um, they also, the city also responds about the access points, right? The city says that according to the traffic impact study, after adding the gas station, the access points for the property will degrade from their current A levels of service to B, C, and D levels during peak hours, depending on the direction of traffic. They say that the impact study shows that a gas station would add a significant increase in the number of daily trips in and out of the subject site. All right, so here's, and then here's this table too that, that shows it. But again, the study was conducted when there were no cars. Zero, it's A, it's A currently because there's no cars entering or exiting the property. That's why it's A. Are they really saying that it has to stay A? I don't think they are. There's no objective standard set forth in applicable city regulations that say you've got to have an A level. There's nothing that says you can't have a D level. You know, there's nothing that says you have to have something above an E. But even if there was, I mean, you look at this table from the staff report, D is still stable. The only grade that's unstable is E and F. Um, but there's no evidence that the, the access points would go from, from where they are all the way down to an E or an F. Um, so there's no objective criteria. That, they, they can't, it was illegal to deny the conditional use permit application on that basis. And you know, also the staff report reveals this to be just a pretext because if you look at this page of the staff report, page 21, it says, if the applicant could meet all requirements, a retail goods establishment could be built on the subject property without gasoline sales or storage as a permitted land use. So a convenience store is a permitted land use. What, a convenience store is not gonna have people driving into it? Um, of course it is. They just don't want a gas station, right? They're not really concerned about the traffic. Boiled down to its essence, they don't like gas, they don't wanna see a gas station here. Um, the city mentions community members complaining about dumping traffic right below a school zone, cars backing up onto 13th East. 
um, additional traffic overburdening to congested arterial roads. That's all just public clamor and speculation. The data presented indicate that the arterials there are not congested. Um, and it's just utterly speculative what for, for, for the community members to, to try to predict what would happen. The only uh, substantial evidence that meets the statutory definition, the only substantial evidence in the record is the traffic impact study. And it says that, well, here it is. It says that the, the proposed use would not substantially impact the surrounding network and would improve safety to the network by consolidating existing access points. The city also says that the proposed use includes a proposed pedestrian connection to the park, which will require pedestrians to walk through gas pump area, the gas pump area and across traffic to access the, the convenience store. Um, so it kind of makes my head spin. It's not pedestrian enough, but they're complaining about the pedestrian connection to the park. All right. Well, the city response goes on to say, though, that the applicant has agreed to comply with staff's suggested condition on this point. So why are they talking about it, right? Only if reasonable anticipated detrimental effects cannot be reasonably mitigated, right? Only if that's the case is the denial appropriate. And the city says in their response, this can be mitigated. Not only can it be mitigated, but the applicant agreed to it. So that's not a that's not a basis to support the denial, um, and there's several places that do that, that go along these lines too. Um, the city's response alleges impacts for which it admits the applicant has agreed to comply with staff suggestions. For example, at page 14, um, they say the site's not designed to enable access and circulation for pedestrian bicycles, but they go on to say that applicant has agreed to work with the staff on that to mitigate that. Okay, so we don't need to worry about that. Page 16, they talk about negative public utility impacts that the applicant has agreed to work with the, the staff on. So that's not a basis to deny the application either. Also on page 16 of the response, they talk about insufficient screening, buffering, and separation, but they go on to say, we'll, we'll mitigate that uh, in accordance with what the city is asking. And then on page 23, they say hours of operation and delivery. Um, is an issue, but they go on to say that we're agreeing to mitigate that as the city uh, staff has asked. So that's not a basis uh, to deny the conditional use permit application. It's just, it's almost like they're just reaching um, even for to things that aren't an issue uh, to, su to support the denial of the conditional use application. Um, they say that the, again, the 2012 uh, prior traffic analysis Right, that's not it. That's not on the record. Um, it's it's a reference to an email in attachment I, uh, but the email in the this this the city's response says that the intersection scored an LOS level of service F according to that 2012 traffic study. But it, the email doesn't even say that, and the and the study isn't in the record at all. And, and in fact, the email itself says the study is outdated. You know, so I mean, substantial uh, evidence uh, under M. Ludma is is some evidence that a reasonable mind would accept is adequate to support the conclusion or conclusion. And you know, an email reference to a 2012 study certainly doesn't qualify. Um, the the study might, if it wasn't 11 years old, but it's outdated as the author of the email even recognized. None of that is substantial evidence um, that would that would convince a reasonable mind. The city further says, this is this is kind of rich. The city says, quote, the traffic impact study expressly states that the intersection is already at a degraded level and is likely to be at the second worst level after development, right? As if those are two different things. They're the same. They're at the same level C and E, right? That's really misleading. The traffic impact study shows that before and after the level won't, won't change. Um, groundwater. Again, there's no evidence of any groundwater to impact. 
and no evidence that there, if there were any, the applicant's protections wouldn't mitigate it. So the city responds that there's evidence of underground storage tanks, failures, leaks, and harms. But that's all speculative, right? That's that there's no evidence whatsoever that the the protections, the procedures, the equipment that the applicant would use had anything to do with any of those releases or leaks. Nothing. So they what they do instead is they talk about this, they bring up this table um, from about prior underground storage tank releases. And it's recreated here in our in our response. This was presented to the planning commission. All right, so most of these, well, overall, um, this is you know the the ones that were uh, for, for all the underground storage tanks that were studied um, in in this study that is the source for the city's information. Seventy four percent of them were just fine, right? So most of the underground storage tanks are just fine and never have any issue. Twenty four percent of those is uh, analyzed in this table, which is recreated. It's copied from what the city the staff report had. I, I have looked at those materials, Mr. Hogle. Okay, I just want to say, I just want to respond to what the city says about the unknown ones. You know, you can't, it, if it's an unknown cause, it's completely speculative to assume that the same condition that caused an, you know, an unknown cause is going to occur with respect to this particular use. Um, all the city's concerns are speculative. There's nothing in the so let me ask you this. Why can't the city or any any person looking at it say 20% of these tanks fail for unknown causes? So that's something that we should have a concern about, particularly because the causes are unknown. Well, they're they're unknown. I mean, they're unknown in the reporting. Um, I mean, if you know. If they're unknown, that that just means that there's speculation. It's even more speculative that the same cause would occur with respect to this particular use, right? If if you could say, well, some of these are because the tank corroded, all right. Well, that's that's a non-speculative uh, reason for that particular um, leak. But in our case, we can rule that out because our tanks are fiberglass, and fiberglass doesn't corrode. Um, if it's unknown, I mean, how could there's nothing you can do to mitigate something that's unknown? Um, he, here's the answer to that. All right. The city has to, um, if a regulation doesn't plainly restrict the land use application, then the land use authority shall interpret and apply the land use regulations to favor that land use application, right? So, what the city should have done is interpreted and applied its regulation in favor of our application, not go out for in a search. For speculative unknown causes that may or may not happen with respect to this particular site. We have no idea what kind of equipment was used in these other instances, how old it was, what the procedures were. We presented lots of information that will that should allay the city's concerns. They substantially mitigate any potential risk. Um, let, let me talk about the 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 leaks that they that they found with other come and go stores, okay? There's an email reference to these, I'm sure you've read it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, webs the websites that are linked to are outside the record, so it shouldn't be considered. Uh, but even if, you know, the email itself, which just identifies these websites and links to them, it it's not substantial evidence. It's not something that a reasonable mind would accept as adequate to support a conclusion. Uh, there's no mention in the email or anywhere else about you know what kind of equipment this was, the age, whether come and go was even the operator, or the other circumstances that are important to know to determine whether oh, this this instance could happen uh, on the at the property location. There's nothing like that. And the other thing is, um, there are, as I as I informed the planning commission, there's 450 come and go gas stations. 
the city can present only seven locations that had issues with releases. Seven. Seven out of 450 is less than 1%. If there's any conclusion that can be drawn from this evidence, it's that virtually all come and go stations and most non come and go stations, 74%, have no issue. So it's far more likely than not that there will be no under, underground storage leaks, any leaks, any spills whatsoever. Um, if there are any, there's all the robust protections and procedures that we put in the record in evidence. Okay, but, thank you. Sure. Um, th this is kind of, this is another one. The, the city says that appellant acknowledges that a catastrophic release would impact groundwater in the area. That's really kind of unfair. What we said was groundwater was not encountered in borings that went as deep as 41 feet. And then we said that it would take a rare catastrophic release to impact groundwater in this area, meaning groundwater off the site or groundwater that might be at a depth below 41 feet. That's what we said. Um, the city also says that we failed to provide evidence of what ground of what depth groundwater needs to be at to avoid groundwater impact. That's not our burden. Um, if the land use if the land use regulation doesn't plainly restrict our application, then they have to the city has to uh, interpret and apply the regulation to favor the land use application. To deny the conditional use permit, the city had to identify an objective standard in an applicable ordinance that the proposed use couldn't meet, even with mitigations. The city hasn't identified any objective standard in an applicable ordinance. Surface water. Um, the city says that it's unclear how avoiding impact the groundwater would negate a risk to surface water posed by a leaking underground storage tank. That's completely speculative. There's no evidence that an underground storage tank leak underground would have any impact to surface water. But that's the lengths to which the city is going to go to to try to save this denial. The city also says that stormwater from, from a gas station would be laden with, with gas and migrate south into the Sago Lily installation. There's no evidence that the uses protections won't substantially mitigate impacts to surface water, none. We're not required to eliminate impacts, again, only, uh, only mitigate them. Um, air quality. The city says that there is evidence of, quote, holistic harm to air quality posed by gas stations, which encourages vehicle transportation. They say vapors, quote, could present, end quote, a threat to human health. It's speculative, but you know, I keep going back to this. They've got to identify an objective standard set forth in an applicable ordinance, and they can only deny the land use application, the conditional use permit application, if impacts can't be mitigated, just not to their liking, but to achieve compliance with applicable standards that have to be objective. There's nothing like that. So how, how how much vapor in the air? How much is too much? Right? They haven't even identified a study that says what risk, what level is 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 risky for human health or anything. They haven't mentioned anything like that. All we know is they they don't want there to be vapors from a gas station. That's all we know. That's impossible to comply with. It's not objective. Okay. Finally, the the city says that the planning commission found that three anticipated detrimental effects could not be mitigated with reasonable conditions, right? That's what they say. Quote, could not be mitigated with reasonable conditions. Again, I keep harping on this. I'm going to beat this like a drum. That's the wrong standard. The test isn't whether anticipated detrimental effects could be mitigated with reasonable conditions. That leaves out the critical piece, right? Has to be, they have to say that it can't be mitigated with reasonable conditions to achieve compliance with applicable standards that are objective. The city has identified no such standard. Um, 
And, and that goes for each one of these three allegedly un, unmitigable impacts. So the first one is, quote, inconsistency with master plans and future land use maps. So according to the city, the appellant has failed to address the Planning Commission's findings related to noncompliance with a vehicle-centric use that's not in keeping with goals to foster a pedestrian-centric community, right? It's vehicle-centric. It's not pedestrian-centric. Those are utterly subjective standards. Um, they, they can't form the basis for a denial. They can't support the denial. So the reference to the master plans is just basically the planning commission can't do that is your position. They can't do that because the, what they've identified from those master plans is inherently subjective. It's really aspirational. Um, there's nothing objective that a, that a landowner, an applicant can look to to say, yeah, I can, you know, either I can or I can't ever meet that no matter what I do to my proposed use. Another allegedly unmitigable impact is the impact on the level of service of city streets. Again, no objective standard is set forth in an applicable ordinance that the city has identified. What, what traffic engineers look at is the grade for the level of service. And there's no dispute. It's a C and an E, and it's gonna, it, it would be, stay a C and an E, even if this use were allowed, this table 6.1 from the traffic study. The city seems to be saying even one more car on the road is an unmitigable impact. Uh, if that's not what the city is saying, then tell us what the number is. Well, is the city saying 619 or whatever the number is, more cars on the road is an unmitigable impact? What says that 679 is too much? Where's the objective? Uh, standard set forth in an applicable ordinance that says this is too much. They haven't presented it. There isn't. Um, it's it, the, the objective criteria is the graded level of service, right? This is what the city planning staff does all the time. They don't just look at how many new cars there are going to be on the road. They don't look at that. They look at what's that going to do to the grade, uh, the graded level of service. Is that going to make us go from, you know, uh, an E to an F, right? Is that what the issue is? It, but that's not the situation here because it's the C and E, and it would stay a C. The only impact would be a, a 0 0.1 reduction, and there's and that's that's insubstantial. Okay, the last allegedly unmitigable impact is impacts on air, water and the introduction of a hazard to Sugar House Park. That's pure speculation. The city response says, well, there's a possibility of a, of a release. Most the come and go stations, by far, I mean, almost 100%, according to the city's evidence, almost 100% have no issues whatsoever. And there's no proof that there's anything to, to affect in terms of groundwater. There's no proof that the mitigation measures that this use would have would be ineffective. The city says there's no proof of the effectiveness of those protective measures. That's just simply untrue. We presented evidence here. I know you've read this, so I'm not gonna repeat things, but let me just, this, this one flow chart, um, that's an exhibit to our letter to the Planning Commission. Just this one item here, this one line of defense, like storm inlet filters, 97% total petroleum hydrocarbon removal efficiency. What, 97%? That's not effective? I, that is a substantial mitigation by any definition. The problem is that's, that's not what the city wants. What the city wants is us to eliminate any detrimental effects because this property is close to a park. That's illegal under M. Ludlow. If there are no further questions, that's all I wanted to say. I appreciate your time and attention. Okay, thank you. Um, I will now hear from Salt Lake City.
Thank you, Ms. Woodhead. If you'll bear with me, Mr. Hogle went through a lot of material and I'd like to be able to respond as comprehensively but succinctly as possible because um, there was quite a bit of jumping around. I, I think first and foremost where I'll start is with the discussion of what is the record. And the city's view is that the record is what the planning commission had before it in reviewing the application. So the record is not every piece of email that has gone back and forth between the city and the applicant. It's not even, I mean, it's not, it, it's nothing except what the planning commission had in deciding upon when it reached its findings and conclusions. But so that would include those, Mr. Hogel's letter that came a couple days before the hearing. Absolutely. And all Mr. of the Hogel's materials. Mr. Hogel's letter and all of his um, exhibits to that letter, which I believe was um, all at exhibit two of his appeal brief. I th completely agree that is in the record. But the other things, um, for example, the traffic impact study itself is not in the record. There are excerpts of that study that are referenced in the staff report and in Mr. Hogel's response, but the study itself is not in the record because that was not sent to the planning commission members for review. Only what was in the staff report and the attachments there too. So that, that is what the nature of my objections to um, come and go submissions as part of its appeal brief uh, were based on was that those materials, yes, they may have been submitted to the city, but because they were not submitted to the commission, uh, were not part of the record before them in reaching their decision. The second component of what is the record, uh, Mr. Hogel has, takes issue with the city referring to materials that are in public comments. Public comments, I don't think it's in dispute that those are in the record, but I'm not aware of any uh, authority for the proposition that the city has to prove that the planning commission members clicked on the links that are clearly in those public comments in order to refer to those materials. They're clearly in the public comments. There's no reason to believe that one or more or all of them weren't reviewed by the Planning Commission members as they had that opportunity to do so. And I don't think it makes any sense that somehow we're, we're limited to on the face of what is in the document themselves. The documents clearly refer to those links. Those links were accessible. This is not, I believe, the comparison to what well, we could cite to the internet in its totality is, I believe, a completely apples and oranges argument. These were specific links specifically relevant to this application and the actions at come and go gas stations. So we believe it's completely appropriate to refer to those public comments and to the material identified in those public comments as those materials were in the record before the planning commission and support the planning commission's findings and conclusions. So I'm gonna try and address these kind of in batches on various the various issues that Mr. Hogel addressed. He reiterated a number of times that the city is not approaching this application according to objective standards in a published ordinance. And that's simply not correct. The city and the staff report does a very good job at going through the standards that are in city code. The city code requires four approval standards and then requires the planning commission to evaluate 15 potential detrimental impacts. Those are the objective standards 
that the city relied upon in reaching um, its recommendation in the staff report and that the planning commission agreed with in its conclusion in denying the application. Those are clearly established in the code. There was no contention before this evening by the applicant that those standards were not reasonable or not sufficiently objective. So I don't believe that holds a lot of weight. Yes, the there might be language in the staff report and there might be language in the city's brief submitted in connection with this appeal that language in a stray paragraph doesn't state an objective standard, but as long as the standards that the application was evaluated against are the standards in the code, then those are what the city properly considered and what the planning commission properly considered in, in deciding on this application. For example, the, the issue of the master plan compatibility. That is an established standard in the code and is a well-recognized uh, metric by which applications are considered. If an application is not consistent with the master plan, that is a basis for a jurisdiction to consider whether or not that application should go forward. There's no authority for the contention that any uh, language or verbiage in a master plan must be objective. Master plans are in, the, in and of themselves vision documents. They are created to describe what a community wants to see in the future in terms of development. And that is how Salt Lake City's master plans are written. The objective so let me standard, ask you, what about a phrase like pedestrian friendly? Is that too vague for a developer? I, I, you know, Mr. Hogel says there isn't any way to measure. There isn't any way for a property owner or developer to measure if they're meeting that standard ahead of time. I think the standard is such that the planning commission is charged with weighing how much an application complies or doesn't with the goals of the master plan. There is not a specific threshold, I would agree in that statement, but the planning commission, it's kind of a totality of the circumstances view that just as Mr. Hogel says, well, it complies in the nature that it will be a one story building and that it's redeveloping a vacant site and, um, what was the third, that it would allow people to choose what kind of transportation mode they wanted. Um, yes, sure, that those comply with the master plan, but there's no reason why the planning commission could not consider the ways in which it doesn't. And the planning commission has the discretion to weigh, these are the ways it does comply, these are the ways it doesn't, and on the whole, do we consider an application more compatible or less compatible with, compatible with the master plan and make its conclusion accordingly? And that's what we think happened here. Not that uh, come and go was, there, there are no standards in the master plans that, that say, if you do not meet this, you will be denied. And that is not what the city employed at all in this application. It was merely a totality of the circumstances analysis of, yep, it maybe is compatible in some ways, but in a lot of ways it's not compatible. And so that's why the planning commission had substantial evidence to conclude it did not comply with the master plan because it was not a low intensity use. Now, Mr. Hogel reiterated a number of times that the planning commission was required to favor come and go's application. And there's a number of issues with that. 306, 1098-306 has a big if at the beginning. If a land use regulation does not plainly restrict a land use application, the land use application, the land use authority shall interpret and apply the land use regulation to favor the land use application. Well, such favoring, as is clear from that sentence, 
only applies unless the land use regulation does not plainly restrict the application. And restrict is not a term of art. Restrict just means restrict. Make, put restrictions on. And it's clear from the city's code that a gas station is subject to restrictions. It's subject to restrictions by being a conditional use in this zone, and it's subject to restrictions by being within the groundwater protection overlay. So the idea that it's not plainly restricted just is incorrect on the face of pure land use regulation application. So, and such favoring also doesn't require a jur jurisdiction to assume facts, not in evidence that would favor the application. And such favoring doesn't require a jurisdiction to give more weight to an applicant's evidence over any other evidence. That's not what this statute says. And we believe that come and goes uh, statements that imply that that is the way that statute must be applied is simply not correct. So to preface the city's responses on a number of these issues is that the appeals hearing officer in your role must affirm the planning commission decision unless it's arbitrary, capricious, and illegal. And, and there's no other or contention. <laughs> Not and or, but that's a, go ahead. Or, <laughs> yes. Apologies, or illegal. And there's no contention as far as we're aware of by the applicant that there's some violation that is not related to the substantial evidence standard or the standards in LUDMA. It's applicant's burden to prove that the Planning Commission um, was incorrect in its decision, and it has the burden to marshal the evidence of that incorrectness. Now, we think there's a number of reasons why the applicant has failed to do so in this appeal. First, we believe that the applicant's effort to ask you to reweigh the evidence, specifically on the issue of the master plan compatibility, and again, on the issue of the traffic impact study evidence that was obtained. That's not an appropriate activity for the appeals hearing officer. The, the, the role is only to analyze the evidence that the planning commission had and to determine if a reasonable mind could reach basically the same conclusion that there was substantial evidence. We think analysis of the, and the staff report goes into great pains in doing this, in identifying that it is not because that it, it is not a gas station per se that is the issue. There are other gas stations in the city. People that drive gas power vehicles need gas stations, and the con and conditional uses uh, that concept acknowledges that some uses are not desirable in various locations, but may need to be permitted if um, they're necessary or desirable in that area, um, even though they, they pose issues that may need to have conditions in order to mitigate detrimental effects. The proposed site is 0.83 acres, and it's located immediately adjacent to a regional park and a public school. The planning commissioners could properly consider their own experience and knowledge of the area and the parks adjacent to the property, including memories of flooding down banks, watching fireworks from the grassy areas, field games, walking around the pond, picnicking, children playing in the grass, and dogs wandering everywhere. 
Many members of the public from across many communities wrote to the Planning Commission regarding their use of the park and the value they place in being able to use it as a, as a gathering place for exercise and recreation for their families. It is the unique importance of this park as well as the environmental resources that flow through it directly downhill from the proposed site that make it unsuitable for a gas station. Let me ask you this though, when the planning commission um, made its decision, um, I think the motion was made by um, Amy Burroughs, she didn't cite, no one cited, you know, and based on our experience and our knowledge of the park. They just basically kind of recited what was in the staff report. So how does how does that fit in with the way their their decision making is is documented? I don't think they need to expressly state that oh by the way I'm thinking of all of the ways I've used this park and all of the ways I know my neighbors have used this park and all the ways I think this park is likely to be used in the future. I think that is a subtext of any decision that the Planning Commission is going to make, that they can appreciate the, 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 their knowledge of the property and analyze the uh, reasonably anticipated detrimental effects from a particular use on that property to the extent that they are familiar with it. Okay. So I hope I hope that answered your question. It does. Thank you. So like I was saying, city code requires a conditional use application to comply with four approval standards and to demonstrate substantial mitigation of detrimental effects according to 15 factors. And appellant bears the burden of proof to show it has met all four approval standards. And one of those standards is showing that the reasonably anticipated detrimental effects have been substantially mitigated. And appellant simply can't do that here. The Planning Commission concluded that the application did not meet these standards because of incompatibility with the adjacent park and residential community in the area and because of unmitigable impacts to soil, water, air quality, and traffic, as well as inconsistency with master plans for the Sugar House community. I, I realized that um, the applicant took issue with my thoroughness in the briefing on all of the factors that uh, were considered in the staff report and that the Planning Commission um, adopted, but we think it's important to show that this was not a off the cuff decision. This was not a response to public clamor. That there is a lot of material cited in the staff report about all of the steps that um, the Planning Commission considered in terms of detrimental impacts and mitigation to reach its decision. It didn't just look at the site look at the park and say, oh, we don't want this. Never mind, go away, denied. That there is a lot of work in analyzing all of the, the approval standards and all of the detrimental impacts. And we think it's important that that be a component of how the Planning Commission's decision is viewed. That yes, there were only three standards that the Planning Commission decided um, were not met because the detrimental impacts could not be substantially mitigated, but that was after um, a very robust consideration of the numerous detrimental impacts posed by this gas station and the mitigation steps that uh, planning staff iterated were proposed and that the applicant accepted as, as a way to move its application forward. I find it a little bit befuddling the applicant's contention that, well, we don't think there's any detrimental impacts. You know, we, we, we just comply with state and federal regulations on this stuff. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me because if there, there weren't these detrimental impacts, why would there be all of these state and federal regulations to keep our 
air, water, water and soil clean? Why would there be fiberglass tanks? Why would there be a 10 step storm water filtering system? I don't think it, and the stories that the city found, which were by no means exhaustive, we did not go out and find them. Those were presented to us in public comment that I identified some, who knows how, how many they represent um, of specifically come and go gas stations in approximately the last 10 years that have had leaks and spills. Um, Mr. Hogel's contention that, oh, well, see, we never really have these. The city was only able to find five of them is completely without a basis in the record. There's no indication that any member of city staff or any member of the public did any kind of exhaustive um, survey in that way. And the public comment we think is so interesting and so significant and that it is specific to come and go gas stations. This was not, oh, we found a issue with a Maverick over there and a Chevron over there. And 25 years ago, there was another issue with, gas station names are escaping me at the moment, but there's a lot of different names of gas stations and brands, but these are not cherry picked from many different operators over a long time period. Although I do think there was, ago. I do think there was one public comment that listed statistics that were more, I don't want to say the word universal, but that weren't specific to come and go, sort of more information about um, that kind of history. Absolutely, the, the Department of Environmental Quality's data is not operator specific. It's across all underground storage tanks that it analyzed in a given year. Um, and the city did not contend that that was specific to come and go by any means, but that data acquired by a subject matter expert um, that is doing these compliance tests, we think is substantial evidence for the planning commission to rely on and looking at, hey, according to the regulator, 24% of these underground storage tanks are not in compliance. That's a significant issue. And I'm a little bit confused by Mr. Hogel's contention that, well, these are all speculative. We don't know if there will be impacts to soil. We don't know if there will be impacts to water. We don't know if an underground storage tank will leak. Well, that's not what the conditional use standard is. The standard is reasonably anticipated detrimental effects. Maybe what, some if of he, those if objection. Come and, if come and go says, these are historically the detrimental effects related to the storage and dispersal of fuel at a gas station. And we've taken these, you know, 25 steps to mitigate those, those risks. It, what more can they do? Yeah, that's, that's a fair point. Um, we, the, the city, are, are not petroleum um, risk engineers. We're not environmental quality experts. Uh, the Planning Commission is comprised of lay people and they can only rely on the evidence that was submitted to them and the evidence that they received from uh, AEEC was that this gas station, because of where it's located, poses air quality and water impacts because of spills and the nature of the topography. The um, the, I'm trying to answer your question in terms of what more could they do? Um, I, I think that would take more information from the applicant. I don't think we heard from them on any of the um, reports that were made about where spills and leaks had occurred about, yes, that occurred then, but that would never occur now because we've done X. There's just no evidence in the record of that. 
All we know is that these stations roughly within the last 10 years, um, when these regulations around soil and water um, have been issues for a long time and these regulations have been in place requiring these operators to have these mitigation um, systems, it still hasn't worked. And to be honest, some things just can't be substantially mitigated. We think the Planning Commission was entitled to consider the gravity of a spill or a leak um, here in particular at this park where a spill or a leak because of the topography, because of the large outdoor public space nature and the water resources in terms of the park and Parley's Creek flowing through that area could properly consider the impact and that if it wasn't very, 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 very unlikely, which again, the applicant, they told us a litany of things that they were gonna do to mitigate, but we have no evidence of how effective those mitigation efforts are, except for their fiberglass tank isn't going to corrode and um, their stormwater inlet is going to get out 97% of petroleum, but we don't know, is that still true? If um, there's a huge rainwater event, no idea, no evidence about that in the record. Um, okay, so the, the significance yeah. of the site requires possibly a higher standard and the planning commission in your view was able to weigh that. Absolutely, that the nature of the detrimental effects uh, the Planning Commission can consider as part of its review of the factors and the standards that are in the code. As long as, I mean, I completely agree with Mr. Hogel that we couldn't have invented detrimental effects that didn't go to a standard in our code and then deny the application on that basis. But that is not what happened here. One of those factors of detrimental effects clearly encompasses um, environmental hazards. Having a leak, having a spill, having contaminated water and soil is a, an environmental hazard. And the Planning Commission could probably properly consider the gravity and the likelihood of that environmental hazard in reaching its conclusion about the about whether there was um, whether the detrimental effects had been substantially mitigated. Okay, thank you. Do you, do you have more? Oh yes, <laughs> just trying to look over to make sure I address um, all of the points that were covered because I, I think there's a lot more to, to connect the dots in the city's thinking um, that I, I hope I'm making clear. One of the contentions by the applicant that there wasn't substantial evidence on this issue of underground storage tanks impacting groundwater. Well, even if the applicant's results of their one time boring at the property is accurate. We'll, we'll, we'll make that assumption because we don't have any reason to believe that it's not. Um, there's no evidence of at what depth groundwater needs to be in order to avoid groundwater impacts. We know that these tanks are put in the ground. We know that they leak. We know that uh, the De Department of Environmental Quality found 54 last year alone that leak. We don't know even why they all leak. And an analysis of detrimental impacts and an ability to mitigate does not require the city to identify or for the planning commission for that matter to identify why a detrimental impact is occurring. It has to be connected to the use, absolutely, but to put the burden on the planning commission of identifying exactly why a detrimental impact is occurring 
is not what Utah law requires. It merely requires the Planning Commission to identify the reasonably anticipated detrimental effects and the evidence of other come and go gas stations and evidence from the Department of Environmental Quality bear out that there are underground, the underground storage tanks leaking and they contaminate groundwater um, when they do so. The soils issue, again, the applicant has, has issues with, there's no standard about how much or how little soils have to be or can be contaminated. Um, I don't think that is what Utah law requires. The impact of soils are, is incorporated within that environmental hazards standard that's in the code. And the Planning Commission is entitled to consider the natural consequences of a release or leak. Removal of contaminated soil is a standard practice. Saw that in the stories about releases that occur on property that, that petroleum um, got onto the soil and so it was removed. But it cannot be seriously contended that there's no detrimental impact in having contaminated soils in a public park where people are, people are sitting on the grass and children are rolling down the hills and pets are making contact with the ground. The, the idea that we would just be comfortable with contaminated soils, um, I don't think can be seriously contended um, as, as acceptable or that we should allow um, any amount of of contaminated soils in a public park. Um, that's not to say that um, we're requiring complete elimination of all detrimental impacts, but I think that Utah law does allow for some impacts do need to be um, basically brought to a brought to a place where it's incredibly unlikely to happen when there is evidence that the spot is particularly sensitive. And that's what I think we have here. Soil impacts when it's an adjacent parking lot, you know, not as big of an issue. People aren't likely to be on that ground, on in that grass, in that um, bit of landscaping that's between the parking lots. So I think the, the gravity and the risk can be considered in the amount of mitigation that uh, the Planning Commission considers uh, substantial enough. Now, uh, there's a number of um, issues raised with the traffic. Um, so that was so the, the, the three um, unmitigable impact factors that the city identified was incompatibility with the master plan which I believe I've addressed that the Planning Commission was entitled to consider the ways in which this application did comply with the master plans, the ways in which it didn't. The Planning Commission clearly concluded that the ways in which it didn't comply with the master plan were greater um, and that renders the application um, inconsistent with that master plan and thus violates that factor. Any contention that, at least of what I've seen in the, in the briefing and what I've heard from the applicant is um, not really contending with the Planning Commission's conclusions on the fact, on the kind of components that it said it didn't, that didn't comply with the master plan. Um, all I'm hearing is a request to, to reweigh the factors that instead you should consider the because it is a one story building, because it is um, redevelopment of a vacant property, um, you should weigh those factors more heavily and conclude in the way the opposite that the planning commission did. But I don't think that's appropriate. And, the, and I think there is substantial evidence in what the planning commission did see in the master plan to support its conclusion that the use was a low intensity was not a low intensity use and therefore did not comply with the master plan. So the third, the second one is the, is the traffic and the standard is objective in the code. The standard is 
that um, there is an unreasonable impact on the service level of an abutting or adjacent street. So the, the traffic impact, the only traffic impact study in the record, which again, there's only excerpts of the traffic impact study that was submitted to the Planning Commission, not the entire traffic impact study, shows impact on the intersection 2100 South and 13th East um, and, and the access points. And there's no reason, there's no, authority for the proposition that the city couldn't consider increase from the current condition. The, I, we, I understand what um, the applicant is saying about the chart that it refers to in its brief um, from the traffic impact study that says the conditions won't change that C, they show that it's at CE now and that it's going to be at CE then. Well, that contradicts the conclusions in its own traffic impact study. The portions of the study quoted in the staff report clearly say that the intersection overall is currently at a level D, which is a degraded condition, and will become E. So whatever, I don't know if there's a disconnect between the figure that the applicant is citing and the um, narrative conclusions reached in its own traffic impact study, but that's the conclusion drawn. And more likely, we think that it's just an assessment of the overall condition. Um, yes, there might be peak times that are maintaining their same level of service, but an, an assessment by a traffic engineer um, of the overall condition says it's going to degrade and that this uh, proposed use is part of that degradation because it is consistent with the background conditions that will lead th that intersection to go from D to E. But it's clear from the um, excerpt cited by the applicant that the access points will significantly degrade that they will go from their current condition A to B, C, and D. Um, it's, it's a hypothetical. I don't know what the Planning Commission would have um, thought was acceptable if just going to B would be okay if that's what happened to the, ac to the access points, but that's not what was in the uh, traffic impact study. It did show um, the unreasonable impact and the Planning Commission could have reasonably concluded that the access points on 13th East and 2100 South would be would in would be unreasonably impacted and having them go from A to B or C or D, depending on the level the direction of traffic. So want to move on to the, I think that I, I addressed all of um, Mr. Hogel's issues with, with the traffic, um, but we think the standard is objective in the code. And we think that the, uh, both in conjunction with the traffic impact study and the testimony or, and the public comments received on the traffic issue is significant and, and both, um, uh, troughs, if you want to call it, of evidence was properly considered by the Planning Commission. This, this wasn't an issue of public clamor and uh, members of the public just vaguely asserting traffic issues. There were a number of people that lived very near it, described in detail the current functionality of the roadway there, and described how in their experience with other businesses um, that have a vehicle focus, how those businesses have impacted roadways and that that um, was a reasonable um, experience and um, to, to bear on what the traffic impact would be here from putting in a gas station. A gas station creates an incredible number of trips, 1,500. Yes, a significant number of them are pass-bys 
um, about 850. But that's still drawing traffic to this area. And I think that's an important component that even if they are not, um, even if more than half is, are not generated new trips for this particular site, it is drawing traffic to this area in an area where there's already an incredible amount of congestion in an area where the intersection is already at a degraded level of service and where it will become an even more degraded level of service with development. So moving on to the third factor that the planning commission concluded did not, um, that there was not substantial mitigation of the detrimental effects were the uh, environmental hazards. And the planning commission received a lot of evidence about this. It received a lot of evidence in the staff report. It received a lot of evidence in the public comment um, and specifically from the community, recognized community organizations for this area. Uh, the proposal poses significant impacts to Sugar House Park, Parley's Creek, Hidden Hollow Park, and the Jordan River. There are potential leaks from underground storage tanks, gasoline surface spills, and air quality damage from gasoline vapor. And the Planning Commission received a significant amount of evidence about this. Um, the evidence I was referring to from DEQ, about 24% of underground storage tanks um, failing on their spill protection, overfill prevention, corrosion protection, and their release detection requirements. And it can't be reasonably contended that such leaks wouldn't have a detrimental effect. Um, UDQ tells us that these leaks result in contaminated groundwater and in some cases, explosive situations. The surface water impacts, Oh, before I move on, the, the Planning Commission received evidence regarding a release at a come and go in Waterloo, Iowa in 2011, when up to 4,000 gallons of unleaded gasoline was identified when a sheen appeared on a nearby creek. And that was from a fill line used to fill the storage tank. This gas station proposes, I think, a little more than 50,000 gallons um, across its tanks. And we received no, the Planning Commission received no evidence about what kind of failure the mitigation efforts proposed by the applicant could handle. Um, and I, and the Planning Commission could properly consider the amount of fuel that was being proposed to be stored on the site, which is a, directly adjacent to the proper line, property line of the park, directly uphill from the slope that slopes down into the park and to the pond where Parley's Creek flows into and out of uh, posed a significant risk. And the Planning Commission was entitled to consider um, the evidence that it had about a leak from a prior, from a different come and go station and how come and goes mitigation efforts uh, for that station did not mitigate that release. That release still happened. It uh, contaminated a nearby creek and we don't even know the topography of this site, uh, of, the, of the site where there was release. Um, but the idea that, well, it wouldn't, it wouldn't happen in Sugar House um, just isn't logical based on the topography of the site. The Planning Commission also received evidence that the property, like I was saying, the property is uphill and within 350 feet of the pond in the park and the Parley's Creek flows into and out of the park. Uh, stormwater runoff from the property goes directly into Parley's Creek by way of the storm drain on 1300 East and the and public utilities evaluated uh, this risk. Now, there will be a subsequent component um, where public utilities will determine whether a permit or not is issued under the groundwater protection overlay. But the idea that planning that the planning staff could not alert the planning commission to the effect to the fact that where the property property is located is within the overlay 
is completely absurd. That is what the planning director does. It, I, he identifies the overlays that are identified in, in uh, Title 21A, of which the groundwater overlay is one, and presented that fact to the planning commission. We, we but don't the, claim but the city that ordinance provides a different process for determining if there's relevant risk associated with that. Is that right? That's so I, my understanding. I would, I would disagree with that um, to the extent that and I that that ordinance identifies already that gas stations do pose a risk, which is why they are restricted. But to what extent, um, or rather, to what best management practices will be required is a determination for the public utilities uh, department to make after a land use approval is granted. It would have been completely inappropriate for a permit application to go to public utilities to determine what best management practices would be required due to the nature of the site. Um, these are all going to be very fact specific inquiries if this application wasn't able to obtain the land use approval, specifically the conditional use permit that is required as, as a threshold matter. Um, so the idea that, well, none of this should be at issue here, this was all for public utilities to decide, just doesn't make sense in how our, our code is applied and interpreted and the role of planning to um, note that this use is restricted in this portion of the city according to the overlay that is um, part of the city's land use regulations. As I was saying, many of the uses. Can I just add to that real quick, um, just from the code where that was cited uh, in the overlay, um, in that it does specific, specifically say that any sort of permit is submitted to building services. That's the, uh, for the purpose of reviewing it for issuing a building permit. Um, I'm summarizing that lang language, but we can't issue or even review a building permit until a conditional use is uh, either, is approved if required. And so it's a procedural step that would happen after any conditional use approval. Okay, thank you. And I think I highlighted that in my briefing about this isn't, the permit isn't actually even issued by public utilities. It's planning commission is responsible for interpreting and applying overlays. Permits go to building services and building services makes a referral to public utilities about all of these issues. But like I was saying, that would have been completely, and as Nick was um, reiterating, that would have been completely inappropriate if, um, as was determined in this case, uh, the, the conditional use permit could not be approved because of the unmitigated impacts. So I don't wanna go over all of the evidence that we outlined in our briefing that the Planning Commission received on the impacts um, to um, that were that are posed by the fuel spills related to pumps being hit by vehicles, leaks from delivery vehicles, faulty gas pumps that overfill, or excuse me, faulty gas pumps. Um, yeah, the overfill vehicle tanks, heavy downpours, the overrun stormwater basins. We think all of these issues, the pro the planning commission could properly consider as natural consequences of having a gas station. And again, it's not a gas station use in particular that is a problem. It only becomes a problem when evaluated in the context of the particular location proposed, which is that the impacts from a gas station, the detrimental effects are particularly grave and require um, a high level of mitigation because of the park nearby because of the topography and because of the water resources. Okay, thank you. So, so just briefly, um, I, I just wanna summarize what that was. 
So given that 24% of underground storage tanks fail their inspections, given that based on leaking storage tanks identified by UDEQ in 2022, the majority of underground storage tank leaks are caused by issues that were unaddressed by the applicant's mitigation efforts. Only some of them were caused by leaking tanks, um, or excuse me, only some of them were caused by corrosion to the tanks that, apple, that the applicant addressed by saying they would provide a fiberglass tank that didn't corrode. Great, well, that only mitigated about 12% of the um, causes of tank leakage. Um, I think the Planning Commission could properly conclude that 12% is not enough mitigation for a tank uh, leak of that nature in that, in that location. Uh, given the downhill topography of the public recreation and water resources relative to the proposed site and the inescapable nature of gravity, given the identified degradations in service on adjacent roads from traffic entering and exiting the property, and given the operator's own record of spills and leaks at other station, only if, um, Ms. Woodhead, you, you think that all of this evidence is not adequate to support a reasonable mind that the detrimental effects of the gas station could not be substantially mitigated should the Planning Commission's decision be reversed. There's a strong presumption that that um, decision be affirmed and only if it was arbitrary and capricious or illegal um, can it be reversed. Appellant has failed to meet its burden of proving that the Planning Commission's decision to deny the conditional use permit was incorrect. There is substantial evidence the proposed gas station on the property did not comply with the code standards on conditional uses. The applicant, yes, did tell us a lot of ways in which it would mitigate, but those ways in which it would mitigate did not substantially mitigate the detrimental effects um, according to the, its own data that it provided. Um, the Planning Commission thoughtfully considered all of the detrimental effects and analyzed which could be sufficiently mitigated and proposed conditions as to those effects. But there was substantial evidence that some could simply not be mitigated sufficiently. The Planning Commission correctly applied the standards in city code, chapter 21A.54 and LUGMA. And accordingly, we request that you affirm the decision of the Planning Commission in all respects. Go ahead, Mr. Hogel. Do you have things you'd like to respond to? I think you do. I do. Um, thank you, Ms. Woodhead. I appreciate the opportunity. The, the city's position on what the record is, is just, it's untenable. Um, it's not just what they cherry picked from the record to present to the planning commission. It's everything that went before the city staff to the city. Um, Utah law require, has um, requirements in place in MLUDMA as to what the city has to do with um, when they're presented with a land use application. And all of that is part of the record, all the back and forth. The untenability of the city's position is, is just uh, vivified when you look at the traffic impact study. So the city says, no, the whole traffic impact study is not on the record. Well, the staff report itself relies on the traffic impact study. So what the city is saying is that the planning commission made a decision. They denied this application based on a traffic impact study that's not on the record. That's untenable. And what makes it even more untenable is she's saying, well, you know, the, the data from the websites that were identified in the record, that's part of the record. <laughs> but the traffic impact study that's also identified in the record, that's not part of the record. The, let me just, um, I'm not sure that this is actually relevant, but it seems to me that the links that were in the various comments are accessible to the planning commission. The traffic study, which may have been cited by planning staff and planning staff had those excerpts, was not accessible to the planning commission because they didn't ask for it. They certainly could have said to planning staff, we've seen these ex excerpts, 
please give us the original report. You could have attached the report to your letter. There are lots of ways that could have been part of the record, but it wasn't, there wasn't a link that somebody can access. So I don't think you can say that that whole report was part of the record. Well, if it wasn't part of the record, then the planning commission denial is illegal because it's based on something that's not on the record. It, the, the traffic impact study is referenced throughout the staff report. The planning commission's denial was expressly based on what was in the staff report. And if the, and if, and if the traffic impact study is not part of the record, then the, the decision should be overturned on that basis alone. You can't have it both ways, right? This is, I mean, this is kind of gamesmanship. You can't cherry pick from the record and then give the applicant 10 minutes at the planning commission hearing to, to make sure that the record includes everything that, that's cited in the staff report for the commission to see. I just, I, that just smacks of gamesmanship to me. I don't think that's, what the city intends to happen with the record with respect to land use decision. Um, I, I did notice that the because I did watch the hearing and I noticed that the commission only gave you 10 minutes. But I also noticed you didn't ask for extra time, which I was curious about. But, you know, that's also on the record. <laughs> yeah, it was made very clear to us that we had 10 minutes. Okay. And that's part of the city's procedure. So, and that makes it all the more untenable <laughs> that matters cited to in the staff report aren't part of the record. That's just, anyway, um, let me move on and talk about the objectivity. Um, M. Ludma is clear that only objective standards can be applied. Requirements that aren't objective, that don't have objective standards cannot be applied. Subjectivity can't be the basis for a denial. The master plans aren't objective and because they have subjective vague notions about walkability and community or vehicle centric and pedestrian centric. I, you know, they're just playing word games here. If the master plans aren't objective, if they don't contain objective standards, and even if they do, but those objective standards aren't brought to bear, then they cannot be the basis for a denial. Under M. Ludma, they just can't. Um, they're, as uh, the city's council says, they're vision documents. They're not meant to have objective criteria. They have to be objective means capable of measurement. Um, the, the reason that M. Ludma prohibits subjective standards is because subjective standards are prone to abuse. Arbitrariness goalpost moving. And that's not what MLEDMA allows. That's contrary to MLEDMA. I'm not asking you to reweigh the evidence. I'm asking you to recognize the lack of substantial evidence on reasonably anticipated effects and the lack of uh, substantial evidence with respect to measures as to whether they will or won't lessen severity of supposed impacts. There's no evidence, for example, there's no evidence of groundwater. I mean, we heard over and over again, well, you know, the DEQ says a leak might, it could impact or will absolutely say, this is give them the 100% the benefit of the doubt. An underground storage tank leak will impact groundwater only if it's there. Groundwater that's not there will not be impacted, 100%. Um, they say, well, if there's no detrimental impacts, then why all these protections? Why all these regulations? Ask the regulators for that. They're, they're nationwide. The federal regulations are nationwide. They apply everywhere. They apply in the Mojave Desert. There's no there's no water in the Mojave Desert, but you'd have to uh, you'd have to follow regulations there too. Um, we want to have we don't want leaks of fuel because if fuel is leaked out, we can't sell it to customers. That's another reason why. Um, they succumb to the hasty generalization fallacy, right? Well, 28% of leaks of storage tanks leaks 
So that means these have to leak too. I mean, that's not even a preponderance of the evidence. That's not even more likely than not. They can't even say most tanks leak. What the evidence that they brought uh, before the, in the record is that most tanks don't leak, right? And we don't even know. The ones that do, they don't have enough evidence to tell us why they leak. Most of them are unknown. Some of them, we know they won't leak here because uh, fiberglass doesn't corrode. We also know that our hoses have no joints. The hoses that uh, connect the fuel to the pumps, they will not leak. They will not. Uh, we know that the, uh, the dispensers are protected. We know with, with concrete steel bollards, we know that they're automatic dispenser shutoffs. We know all that with, it, with this. They say that the, the um, well. I understand that Come and Go has taken significant steps to try to mitigate any risk in this circumstance. But does the planning commission have the ability to say, because of the park, because of the water sources, um, that we're going to require something close, something higher, a higher standard, and because the the consequence of the risk is higher? No, no. The law is in M. Ludma that they can only deny the condition if they're if we can't substantially mitigate. That's it. Substantially mitigate. That's the standard in the law. What the city wants you to adopt is a different, more onerous standard. I wrote it down. We have to make sure, according to the city, that it is, quote, incredibly unlikely to happen. That is not the law. That is contrary to the law. That's a higher standard. They cannot impose that. That in and of itself makes the decision illegal. Um, The objective standard that was identified with regard to um, traffic was whether there will be an unreasonable impact on service level. Well, we know that there won't be an unreasonable impact on service level. There won't be any impact on service level. It's a level C and a level E, and it'll stay that way. Now, we heard um, from the city talk about, well, no, it's based, it's, it's a level D, and it's going to, because of this use, it would be a, a, a level E. That is a misstatement, an incorrect statement from the staff report. On page 14 of the staff report, it says, quote, under background future traffic conditions, without the development of the subject site, delays would increase slightly at study intersections due to regional traffic growth. The signalized intersections would operate at LOSE or better. It's not because of us. That's just because it's because of regional traffic growth. Ms. Pasker says that's because of us. That's wrong. He also said that um, that this site, this use would draw traffic to the area. The staff report recognizes that a use like this, a convenience store gas station, it doesn't draw in folks. It's not a destination site. It attracts people who, motorists who are already on the road on the way somewhere else. The city talked about impacts to the Jordan River. There's no evidence that the Jordan, the Jordan River is miles away. There's no evidence that the Jordan River would be impacted. The evidence in the case is, is only Parley's Creek. Only Mr. Draper only identified Parley's Creek. When he didn't stop there, he said mitigation can happen. That's he said that's why you need mitigation. That's what we're proposing to do. Again, we heard about the Waterloo instance um, and, and whether quantities, you know, what quantities were spilled. That, all of that is completely outside the record. It's not in the record. What are they going to do if, if we have to go to district court on this? That's not in the record. They can't transmit that part. And it's completely speculative. 
And the council even admitted it. She said, we don't know. We don't even know what was used, what equipment was used in Waterloo. That's what makes it speculative because you can't say that the equipment that we put forward that we plan to use here with, was involved in those instances in Waterloo or anywhere else. So it's completely speculative that, they, that what happened in those other places would happen here because we don't know what they used. And it's not our burden to come forth, to come forward and say, no, we'll, we'll be better than that. That's not our burden. It's the city under M. Lunma, it's the city that has to identify a reasonable anticipated detrimental effect that can't be reasonably mitigated um, to achieve compliance with standards, with applicable standards. That's their burden, it's not our burden. The groundwater ordinance. Um, they say it's, it would be completely inappropriate to submit this application to the public utility department, completely inappropriate. But they want to mention the groundwater um, ordinance. They want to invoke it, and and they and they profess to be to have to lack expertise. I mean, this is really rich. It's inappropriate to submit this application to the public utilities department, but it's okay for them to come and say this is a problem under this groundwater ordinance. And guess what? We lack expertise. We don't know. We don't know anything about gas or impacts to, to groundwater or anything like that. The public utilities department does. And they're the ones required to review development plans for new restricted uses. If, if they don't have the expertise then, and they don't want to uh, refer it to the public utilities department, then it's irrelevant. Um, those are all the comments I wanted to make in response, unless you have any questions for me. I don't have any further questions. Does anyone have anything else on this? Okay, I'm gonna close the hearing. I'm gonna take this matter under advisement and I hope to have a decision in about two weeks. It might take a little bit longer. There's a lot of material here. Um, I sometimes promise two weeks and don't pull it off. So I'm letting you know right now that it might take me a little bit of extra time. And um, thank you all for coming. I appreciate everyone's input. Really good work from everybody on this. Thank you. 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 Have a good evening.